welcome to All in Yellow. The official Norwich City podcast. Today we're speaking to a former player, youth team coach and manager at the club. And he's certainly done it all at Carroll Road, so we're very excited to be chatting with Neil Adams today. Neil, it is an absolute pleasure to have you here with us today at Carroll Road. And for those who don't know, let's just start off, take us back to your time before Norwich, really. Um, obviously a very long uh, playing career. I started at Stoke City, um, which is my, my boyhood club, if you like, you know, born in Stoke-on-Trent. And played for Stoke for a year and then got what would be now called a dream move to Everton um, after one season as a, as a pro. Uh, Everton at the time were certainly the best club in England, probably one of the best in Europe. So as you can imagine for a 19-year-old kid, then to get that opportunity was, was fantastic. Um, went to Everton, we, we won the what would be the Premier League now in the first year. Uh, had three really good years there, really enjoyed it and learnt the game. And then had five equally successful years at, at Oldham Athletic, where winning the championship, getting into cup finals and, and obviously in the Premier League before I signed for Norwich in, in 1994. So uh, I, was, I was relatively late into the game uh, at Stoke at 18 years old. I mean, kids are at clubs now at nine, eight, nine years old. Wasn't the same then, back in the day. I think the earliest you could be at clubs was about 14. Um, so joining a club at 18, you know, maybe I thought my chance had gone, but it, it, fortunately it hadn't. Um, and so when I arrived at Norwich, and Norwich at the time were a top three club in in the in the Premier League, um, it was it was an equally fantastic move for me at the time. So uh, so yeah, plenty of games with Stoke, Everton, and Oldham before I arrived in uh, in sunny Norfolk. Yeah, you mentioned Oldham there as well. There's quite a big difference in size between Everton and, and Oldham. What did that feel like? The change? It, it was. Um, I mean, as, as I just said, Everton were, were were massive then. I mean, they're still a huge club now, but the success obviously has waned unfortunately in the years since. But they they, they were the they just won the the European Cup Winners Cup. They just won the league title and been in the FA Cup when I signed there. And as I said, we then went on to win the league and I was a part of that squad. Um, so a huge, huge club. You know, the only disappointing thing is we couldn't play in the Champions League because of the uh, the ban on English clubs. Um, but you can imagine then the, the size of the club is it's right up there. So people were saying, well, why did you go from a club of that stature to with the greatest respects an Oldham Athletic who at the time were a mid-table to bottom table, uh, table championship team? Um, and the reason be being was simply enough to play games because I played the majority of my games in that first year, fortunately, when we won the league at Everton, but they'd bought other players, they'd spent a lot of money and I was just a squad player then, not even getting near to the team or the bench. So, you know, there's one or two things you could do. Everton offered me a new contract um, and players then have a decision and when they put in that position, you either stay at a big club and take the money, but don't play every week or you maybe have to drop down a level and go and play football. And that's that's why I went to Oldham Athletic. And uh, as I say, they were, a, they were a bottom half championship team then. Um, I had five years there and it, it was probably the best five years in the club's history. We, we got to League Cup finals, we won the championship, we went into the Premier League, you know, with some amazing games and results. And um, so it was, it was personally good for me that I'd left the Premier League team in Everton gone to Oldham and when I left Oldham we were a Premier League team there as well so uh, yeah so so that was Everton and then obviously we talked about Oldham then came Norwich what did you know of Norwich before what was your perception of the club I think well at the time they were they were a top three club you know that's why I came here they just just qualified for the UEFA Cup the previous season they, they'd just been eliminated from the UEFA Cup when I signed um, prior to that obviously Norwich were a, were, a, were a top top flight club but not won a lot the, you know the success in the in the league cup, but you know a, a decent top flight team. But obviously the the ninety three season when they finished third got got themselves into the U, uh, UEFA Cup was it put them as a top club yeah. then. So when a, when a club like that comes calling for you, obviously you're very interested. It was almost similar to to Everton when I was at Stoke. You know it's a massive club, and now I'm at Oldham in the Premier League. But Norwich want you, you know, and they're a well, we're a top three club the season before, so. Obviously, really keen to come down here, and it just took so long because um, I found out from my agent that, that Norwich wanted to sign me. At, I think it was about the November time, and I didn't actually sign here till late February. And it went on and on and on, and I was pretty keen to come down here and, and you know join the club. And 
as it is, you know, the, the negotiations are going on and it didn't quite happen and then it was back on and off. And thankfully, in the February of 94, just after they'd, they'd been eliminated from the UEFA Cup, then I got the opportunity to come down here and uh, I've been here ever since. <laughs> so February 94, I guess Mike Walker must have just left. Yes. Did you just miss yeah. him? Yeah. So who was in charge? John Dean. John, John Dean, of course. Yeah. yeah, took over and was here for, what was he here for about yeah, a year? Yeah, and then obviously Mike came back um, a year or two later. Mike went to Everton, ironically enough, and then came back here. Um, and Mike was brilliant as a manager. You know, I could see why he had the success here. You know, the players loved him. You know, and that isn't that isn't always the case with managers. You know, normally got the, the 11 that are picked week in, week out, players tend to like them the rest don't but Mike was he had that sort of knack about him to to be one of the lads at the right time when he needed to be but also to crack the whip equally when he needed to be and uh, yeah but uh, John Dean signed me here um, after after Mike had left John took over um, but, and then I think I had about six managers in about five <laughs> years here it was quite a turbulent time unfortunately for the club after the UEFA Cup success we then went into two, three years of financial um, difficulties and, and big change for the club. And it was unfortunate that that period of time. Who actually reached out for you then? How, how did you know that, that Norwich were interested in you in the conversation? Through, through my on? agent at the time. Um, yeah. I think Rule Fox at the time was on his way to, to Newcastle. Um, so Nor uh, Norwich were obviously looking for uh, someone to play wide right, someone who could cross a ball. Um, and I think that's that's how the initial contact happens. You know, that's normally the way in football. You know, players players will find out things through their agents because clubs will speak to people to speak to agents to speak to players because you can't make a, a direct approach, obviously, but but it happens. We all know it does. <laughs> um, and so yeah, it's normally the agents that normally um, receive and pass on information like that. And uh, so yeah, I just I was I was made fully aware that Norwich were were keen on watching me. Uh, sorry, on signing me. I'm well aware that they were watching me play every week during that period from initially reaching out to signing. Amazing. And what were your initial memories like? Like, do you remember your debut well from Norwich? Uh, I can, yeah. Um, three three draw away at Swindon at the time. Uh, it was literally whirlwind. I think I signed for Norwich on the f uh, Thursday afternoon. Um, reported for training Friday. Got on the bus, drove to Swindon overnight stay, and then a game. So I'd had literally no opportunity to to do anything with the with the team or in regards to tactics. It was just, you're playing, off you go. And I had a bit of an assist for Chris Sutton in one of the goals, <laughs> so not a bad start. Good but start. yeah, it was, uh, it was really hectic. I can remember flying down from uh, Manchester to join, join Norwich and saying to my wife, you know, I don't know when I'll be back. And, and pretty much didn't go back for like three months because we had game, game, game. And she had to come down with the kids and that was it. You know, you got on a plane, you leave. And all of a sudden, you're playing football 200 miles away. It must have been a tough one, really, to sort of explain to the wife, because I'm assuming mm -hmm. you, you couldn't Google at that point Norwich. And, and <laughs> it's it's not everyone who, you know, kind of knows, uh, you know, the area. It wasn't area massively on the map. <laughs> no, it wasn't hugely on the map, necessarily. <laughs> but but obviously, a lot of players, like yourself, come. They fall in love with mm. Norwich, with the town, the people. And even if they go off and, and play for another club, yeah. they come back and settle here. Yeah. And that's what you've done as well. What is it about the area that you... I'd like to say fell in love with. Yeah, I, but I remember on one of my first days here, Ian Crook said to me, he said, look, he said, I'll tell you now, you'll either love it here or you'll hate it. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of said, what do you mean by that? He said, uh, we're, out, we're out on a limb, we're a million miles from anywhere else, you know, every, every away game is three, four hours minimum. It's not like living in a, in a Merseyside or in a Manchester or in, a, in the Midlands, you know, we, we are, we're out on a limb. He said, and he said, I've, he said, he'd been there. He said, I've been here quite a bit. And I see it when players come in. They either can't wait to get back home to wherever home is because it's just too far away and not their sort of their, what they've been used to. Or he said, you'll, they absolutely fall in love with it. And as you say, Dan, you either stay there forever or you go off and do other things, but then you keep your house here or you end up coming back here. And that's what's happened, and you see it a lot of times, don't you, with ex-Norwich players. They end yeah. up coming back here. Yeah, it seems to be. Yeah. And what is it? I don't, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's a fantastic, it's a beautiful place, obviously. You know, Norfolk is, is, a, is a lovely place, you, no matter where. You know, you can live in a, you can live on a new housing estate, or you can live, you know, five minutes away in the countryside, on the coast, or whatever. Um, I think it's the lifestyle, you know, the, the, the place. Um, but, yeah, there is so many that... That say that that's 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 where our base is. That's where our roots are. And that, that's what happened, and 
has happened to me. We were actually saying this earlier, weren't we, about lockdown. It's kind of made people reassess where they want to be. And I, I've seen, like, I've, I'm from Norwich and we're from Norwich, aren't we? But, but like, loving being able to just go to the beach and, and being near farms and, you know, having all of that space just seems like lockdown and the coronavirus crisis has actually made us all appreciate that a bit more, yeah, do you think? Yeah, uh, when, when we came down here, we previously, when we were living in Greater Manchester, we lived on, on a new housing estate. Um, and when we came down, we were like, okay, where, where are we going to live? And it was pretty much, okay, where's the, where the most popular area sort of thing? Normally footballers tend to go to one area, don't they, at a, at a club? And uh, ironically here, they live everywhere because it's so nice. But we had, we had to look around some of, the, some of the areas in Norwich and we thought, you know what? I'd signed a three-year contract. We thought, let's go and live in the sticks. Let's go and live in the countryside and experience it. And if we don't like it, after three years, we're done. We'll go wherever. Um, so that's what we decided on doing, and we've we found a house that we still live in now. Oh, amazing! That's twenty minutes away from the city centre, but it's in the countryside, and it's it's lovely. Um, but the first night when we turned the lights off to go to sleep, <laughs> it was just black. Yeah. You so could quiet. not see your hand in front of you. It was like, wow, because previously, obviously, you got nat- you got street lighting, and it just doesn't go dark. But where where we are now, yeah. you turn the lights out, and I it is jet black. And <laughs> that was a, was a bit of an eye. Thoughts. It was a bit yeah. of an eye opener at the time. But yeah, obviously, we uh, we've loved it. We've been here since '94, me 26 years now, and, and really like the place. So I can't remember. Would you guys have been training at Trous at that point? Yeah, yeah, Trous. Uh, Trous, which I mean, anyone who went to Trous, I mean, the people that are listening to this, you know, it was. It was un- unbelievable, really, in, in in that, and I mean very respectfully, that we were a Premier League team. Norwich are a Premier League team in 1993, 1994. And yet the training ground was, it wasn't even of the the standard of a non-league team. Well, yeah. I must admit, you, you know when you drive through Trous, um, through the uh, like village centre, I guess it's called, there is a football pitch there that's a playground. And as a kid, I genuinely thought that was the training ground. <laughs> <Wow. laughs> yeah, it, it clearly isn't. But uh, uh, No, yeah. they were, they, Trous had two pitches. One was on, on a sort of a 30-degree angle on the bank. Uh, and the other one was okay. Um, but you can imagine all the teams that are using it, the reserves, the youth teams, the first team. It's The, the quality of the pitches were terrible. The, the changing rooms were basically con- four concrete walls. The showers were like two hose pipes sticking out the wall. Oh, that's how it seemed. Um, and just nowhere near the quality now, anywhere near the quality of even like a, you know, a National League North-South sort of setup. How did that compare to Everton then? Was it similar there as well? Or did, did the facilities here give you any kind of feeling that you might not have been making the right move? Or was it quite similar? Uh, do you know what, Alice? You didn't, you didn't bother about it. It didn't, didn't, sort of, didn't sort of concern me at all. You come in, it is what it is. I, I, I didn't bother about things like that. Everton was a lot better. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you looked at the Everton then to the Everton facilities now, they're world class. Yes. Like all the Premier like Colney is. You know, yeah. It's a world class facility now. Fantastic. Um, but you didn't bother the players weren't we weren't moaning about the showers being cold one day you just that's what it was yeah um, but to think then we moved to Colney I think the year later um, and the facilities then you're thinking how on earth did we sort of not that how did we accept that but because we did because it was what it was but it was literally chalk and cheese you know you've gone from four concrete walls and a, a hose pipe as a, as a for a shower <laughs> to like you know uh, ice baths and saunas and swimming pools up at Colney and yeah, yeah. fantastic facilities, pit, you know, six pitches, floodlights. And I mean, how they've got it now is it is they've gone again now. They've, you know, they've they spent amazing. some money on it. It's fantastic. Yeah. There's cameras there. There's wow. the, uh, the pitches are excellent condition. There's floodlights there. You know, there's a new gym there. It's it's incredible. What about the coaches and things? Because obviously you see like strength and conditioning coaches and nutritionalists, and a lot is placed on that. Did you have all of that as well, or was it a bit different then? <laughs> no, you had a you had a manager, <laughs> sometimes an assistant manager, and a physio. That, oh, okay. would, that would pretty much be it for the first. The fantastic team. Tim Shepherd, by the way. <laughs> Tim yes, Shep- who, who, Tim. He was amazing. Mr. Brilliant. Norwich yeah. Shepherd. Yeah. No, yeah. Inc- again, incredible. And that's how. I mean, people may be listening to this who would probably think you're lying. This is not really how it was in the Premier League, and it, the Premier League started '92. You know, so it's not it's not a million years ago. But yeah, I mean, when we came down here, you know, John Dean was the manager, the coach, the physio. There'd be a youth team coach there. 
Um, and that'd be pretty much it. There's no strength and conditioning coaches. Must have had a masseur. No, no masseur. No, no. no. <laughs> that, 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 that was Tim Shepard when he uh, wasn't treating right. people. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, can I have a rub? Yeah, tomorrow at about six o'clock. <laughs> so yeah, different. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, there's there's a team of masseurs now, sports scientists, strength and conditioning coaches, analysts. Incredible. Absolutely incredible for, for what it is now, from what it was. Do you think sometimes the players might be overprotected with an injury or is it, I mean, they're such expensive assets now. Mm. You've got to look after well, them. everything changes, Dan. So you've got to go with it because, and I had this chat with Joe Royal once, you know, over a beer and sort of saying, when we used to come in for day one at Norwich, you always had to do a 3000 meter run. It's like a two mile run. And you had to do it in 12 minutes. That was the benchmark. That was the standard. Everybody's got to be under 12 minutes to do a two mile run. But nowadays, the players will do it on one leg. You know, they'll be doing it in 10 minutes now, nine, 10 minutes. Some of well, back then, obviously, the fitness wasn't what it what it is now. Um, and I can remember, we used to, so we used to do this run every day and, the, and they'd pin it up. Like, it's like a league table. Who was the quickest? Oh, that's hard. So who was the bottom? And it was one of those. You saw where you were in the and group. And where did you tend to feature in it? Well, I was, I was sort of mid, mid, mid group. But one year I got myself really so, fit and did my best time. And my, I'll never forget it. My best time was like 11 minutes, one second for a, for a 3,000 meter run, like wow. I say. And, and I looked when they pinned it up on the board. So you've got about 25 people, 25 players. And I'd have been about, it was about seventh, I think, or eighth, seventh or eighth at the time, which was really good. I was really yeah. pleased with myself. Yeah. So you're thinking, if that's the top six or seven, five years later, I looked again when I'd finished playing and then come back, I was coaching at the academy and they were still doing this 3,000 metre run. I thought, I'll just check where my 11 yeah. minutes, one second would be. And it would have been about third bottom. Wow. And it was like, oh my goodness, like, you know, how how fitness has changed mm -hmm. in such a short space of time. And this is what I was saying to Joe Royal. I was saying, if I was playing now, I said, look, I said, look at the time here. I said, I wouldn't be able to keep up, cope. He said, no, you, you're wrong, you would, because you'd be doing the training they're doing. Yeah, you'd be having the strength and conditioning yeah. coaches and the weight training, you know, you you go with it. Um, and that's why you can't really compare era with era it was you know of the time you know that's what it was then but y you look at the players now you know they are they're like you know like middleweight boxers yeah, you yeah. know there's they're in peak condition and that's why you go back to saying with the with the masseurs with the sports science with the physio they, they have to be because they're so finely tuned now you know that's why there's probably injury a lot more injuries now than there was back in the day and even before me i mean in the 70s, you look at like we talked about Liverpool before. Some of those players would play 70, 75, 80 games a season, which is unheard so of now, and crazy. play every week. And play through injuries. And, sometimes correct. Yeah. As on, well. on really bad pitches, yeah. you know, waterlogged and muddy pitches. And, you know, they, they just couldn't, if they'd have been as finely tuned as they are now, they'd be pulling muscles left, right, and centre. So it, it is. Of, of the time, as I say, of the era, but... Uh, did you have the bleep test, though? Oh, I did the bleep <laughs> test all the time. It was uh, it was the one that was dreaded by That's every football. Around. Yeah. <laughs> They've changed it. They've changed oh, it now. Okay. It used to be just run until yeah. you either fell over or were sick. That was yeah. the... Just keep going until oh. you, you, you couldn't go anymore. And you got to certain levels. And I think good at the time was about 14, 15. Wow. And that was literally 20 metres, just running, running, and increasing the speed until you, you stopped... And then they changed it to you ran one length and then you had a five second wait and then mm -hmm. you start. They just changed it up and it's not the, the old fashioned bleep is different now. Yeah. They have all these new new ways of testing fitnesses now, but it was always a benchmark that you know. I remember it from school. And I didn't even <laughs> play football back then, and it wasn't yeah. nice. It's, it's like it haunts my dreams. <laughs> that start of level two. That's do, it. Do, do, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, that's that's preseason again. Now preseason was dreaded by every footballer prior, probably prior to the mid nineties. You know, because you knew the first week would be running. Mm -hmm. You know, you wouldn't see a football. Um, down here at Norwich, it was round the UEA Lake and up and down the hills there. Or prior to that, I think it was Mouse Old Heath with yeah, Ron yeah. Saunders era. And, you know, the, the stories. And every club had them. You know, you dreaded pre-season because it was hard physical work, not enjoyable. But it was literally just to beat you into shape from mm -hmm. the six, eight, ten weeks that you'd had off over the summer and probably got out of shape, probably put like, you know, a stone of weight on. And it doesn't happen now. Players go away now. They have their own fitness regimes. They come back just as fit as they were when they left. So there's no need to go and beast them every, you know, every day for, for a fortnight. The, ball, the footballs are out and, and and off they go. And that was one, ironically, one of the things with Everton where 
they were forward thinking there. They didn't just run players into the ground. They did get the footballs out and it was a bit different. And they thought you get the fitness in running with the football. Uh, and it was quite unique at the time, whereas most clubs would go, as I say, 10, 12 days of just pure running physical. At Everton, day one was was a bit of fitness work, but a lot of football work as well. Interesting. How would you, sorry, sorry, I was just saying, how would you summarise your time at Norwich? My time at Norwich is still still yes, as ongoing. A, as a player, but as a, as a player um, it was a difficult period for the club, obviously, because of the financial uh, difficulties they had. But, you know, I'd, I'd look at it, I'd like to, someone said to me, you know, how would you describe yourself here? Uh, there was players that were would catch the breath, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the speed merchants. And, you know, I wasn't one of them, but I, I'd like to think I was really consistent, a really consistent player who could could cross a ball. You know, that was what I was brought in to do and something I practiced every day and, you know, I'd, I'd put myself up there with, a, with with anyone as delivering a football. You know, I was good at it. Uh, also with the set plays and the penalties and oh, things like that. The penalties. Legendary penalties. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd like to think, you know, I had good ball control and a really good touch. You know, I could play. I could play, as, as you say. Um, I would have loved to have a bit more pace. Um, but, uh, yeah, I prided myself on my deliveries. You know, I could put a ball into the box where the two centre forwards would want it to be. And saying two centre forwards pretty much tells you how long ago it was. <laughs> yeah. And you missed one penalty? Was I it missed you? one for Norwich, yeah. I was, uh, I had a cold that day though and I slipped and the, the goalkeeper moved and the sun was in my eyes and... Uh, yeah. We'll give you, we'll give you that one off then. As if you focused on the one he missed. And <laughs> I you it, scored 18 of your 19. Me, no, no. Yeah, it's 18, 18 of 19, <laughs> I mean. Yeah, it's not it's bad, 18 of 19, is it? But yeah, it was at Swansea away. Um, it was a terrible day for me because not only missed the, the only penalty for for Norwich, I also fractured my collarbone oh, no. in the last minute of the game uh, badly um, and had to then obviously be on the team coach for a six-hour journey, I think it was, back from Swansea before. And I was in absolute agony, you know, absolute agony. It was like people just stabbing me with knives every bump and had an operation the next day that I've still got nine screws in it now. You can, you can still see them now if, I, if you want to see them, but... They've yeah. kept me out for three months, so not a great day for no, me. Not no, not getting that and missing the, the only penalty. Yeah, I, I can remember at half time in that game actually. I think it was the first, was the first half I'd missed the pen, and I was like, not I was distraught, you know. And I was, Craig Bellamy was sitting next to me, and Bellas was like seventeen or something then, you know, the young, and uh, he could he, everyone could see, you know, leave him, leave me alone, don't talk to him. And, and Bellas came up to me and said. Uh, if we get a penalty in the second half, do you want me to take it? For oh, you? Well. <laughs> you can imagine what I told him. <laughs> but that, that, yeah. was, that was Bella's, you know, he didn't care. Yeah, he's not particularly shy yeah, a, yeah. over the years. I said, no, I'll be fine to take the other one. Thank you, Craig. Yeah. All words to that effect. <laughs> it was, a, I guess, a, a strange, I don't want to call it the doldrums for the club and, and sort of that, that era. But when I was trying to think back, obviously I can remember the 92, 93 season the squads and then when he came on board. And then I was struggling really yeah. to find a defining point over those seasons. I, I remember having a T-shirt, Norwich City on loan to Division One, yeah. you know, one season only limited edition T-shirt. <laughs> but it, is, it obviously dragged on a little bit longer yeah. than that. And what was it like being at the club that had experienced those highs and was perhaps getting a bit frustrated and wondering when they were coming back? Yeah, it, it was difficult because, as you say, you know, there was a lot of players that had been through, you know, that success, played in the UEFA Cup and all of a sudden now seeing some of the best players being sold off. Um, and, and it's difficult in those circumstances because you know uh, every player is, you've got to be honest with yourself, as managers and coaches are, and you could see that, you know, if you're going to be selling somebody who's just scored a lot of goals, then it's going to be tough for you this year. Or you're going to be selling one of your, you know, your best defenders or your goalkeeper or whatever and not replace them with, with equal, then it's going to be tough. And yeah, it, it was a shame. We always seem to start each season really well. You know, we came out the traps flying up to Christmas. We'd always be up there and then players might get sold off and then it seemed to tail away, you know, into a, a, a period of mid-table mediocrity, you know, in, in what would be the championship now. And, you know, the club, you can see the stadium, you know, we talk about the new training ground. It's set up to be a Premier League team. It still is. You know, this is a Premier League club. You know, it's not a giant Premier League club, but it's a Premier League set up in every way now, in every way, shape or form. Um, and so, you, yeah, it's frustrating then when, you know, this is where this is where we should be playing. We all felt we should be playing in the Premier League, but you've got to go and prove it on the pitch and get results. And if you don't, then you don't play in the Premier League. And you had the turbulence. I think 
Martin O'Neill was here for a matter of six months. months. Yeah, yeah, six yeah. months. And I remember the shock waves of it going around. Like, oh, he's gone. Yeah. He's actually gone. What was that like for you guys? Because you must have been starting to really enjoy playing under him. Well, yeah, Martin came. It's like you said, I think I had six managers with caretakers and things like that in five seasons. And uh, Martin came in and Martin was totally different to to most managers. And in that, he, was, he played under Brian Clough. And obviously, Brian Clough was very... And I think a lot of the people that played for Cluffy sort of took a, a lot of his traits and saw how it worked, how they made it work. And Martin, I've read Brian Clough's books. I've, I've actually met Brian Clough. You know, I've played against his teams I'd as well. I'd love to have met Brian. Um, <laughs> love me to too. have met Brian. And, <laughs> you know, you, you don't need me to tell you what he's like. You can tell from watching TV interviews, you know, he's unique. And uh, Martin O'Neill pretty much mirrored himself with that. And, and that's in for the right way because he had a lot of success with it because he saw how Cluffy was and... All the stories you'd heard of Cluffy of not turning up until like Thursday, you know, mm -hmm. for training. Martin was the same, you know, you wouldn't see him on the training ground. He'd just let his coaches get on with it. And you're thinking, where's the manager? And he might come out for the last two minutes, walk around and then go in again. And I'm thinking, I've read about this with Cluffy. Mm -hmm. you know, he used to do this and it was all, I'm pretty sure, pre-planned to sort of get that, wow, he's the manager now. Every, all of a sudden, everyone sits up and he comes out to watch training. Training goes up by 15% and... That's the effect he gets. So Martin came in and um, I can remember his first speech in the, in the changing rooms. He, he didn't say a lot. He just sort of said, lads, he said, if we're doing well, he said, it'll be a holiday camp here. He said, if it's not, he said, I'll be your worst nightmare and walked out. And that was his intro to the team. So we're thinking, mm, this is interesting. And he was, he was one of those managers, Martin, who, as I just said to you before, if, if you're playing, if you're, if you're a regular in the team, which fortunately I was here at Norwich, I played like, 200 games in five mm -hmm. years. You know, the, the 11 that are playing normally like the manager because he's picking them and the yeah. others that aren't don't. But pretty much with Martin, you know, not too many players, even in the team, were pretty fond of him in terms of, you know, like a Mike Walker, oh, a great guy, because he... Was there a fear? Yeah, a sort of a fear. I mean, you, you knew he wasn't going to come and beat you up, but mm -hmm. there was a fear, a professional fear that he might leave you out of the team. Mm -hmm. Or if you fall, if you cross him or he doesn't, you do something he doesn't like... You know, you're going to be in trouble, that kind of a fear. Um, I can remember after one game going into Colney, we just got beat and that was quite rare because, as you say, when he was here, we were top of the league. When he left, I think we were top or second top. And we got beaten and I, it was a Monday morning and I went into the into the canteen. There was only Martin in there and myself and he was filling his bowl with cornflakes or something. And I've gone in and gone, oh, morning, gaffer. And he turned around to me and went, is it? And that was his response, and I thought, oh, oh, okay, I'll yeah. get my cup of tea and I'll go out and sheepishly walked out. But those are the type of things, and you're thinking, you know, he's he's just had a bit of a snap there. I mean, he could have just said, yeah, morning, Neil, how are you doing? But he, did, he probably didn't want to portray that sort of image. He probably wanted, look, this is a bad, bad day for us. We've lost the game, and there's, it's not a good morning. It's a bad morning. So, But if, if you get those type yeah. of things and... Again, reading Cluffy's book, if you, um, if you sorry, if you read Martin O'Neill's book, he, t he talked about when he was at Notts Forest with Brian Clough, he said the best way he could sum it up was if the players saw the manager coming, walking down a corridor, they'd sort of hide out the way because you wouldn't want to confront him. He'd just I'd best, better get out of the way than actually be there otherwise. And it was, it, it was that type of thing like Martin had here, you know, yeah, you had a lot of respect for him. He could have a laugh and a joke, but... You were always like sort of one eye looking over your shoulder. Where is he? What's he doing? That type of, he commanded that type of respect. And we, we were absolutely flying. You know, I think he, he played me in central midfield for the time he was here. Me and me and Mark Bowen, actually. Mark Bowen's a left back. I was a right winger. But I think he saw, you know, that we could work together. We were pretty good on the ball, both of us. We could get hold of a ball and, play, and as I said, and play. And we were keeping people out of the team like J Jeremy Goss and Ian Crook and supporters must have been thinking what the hell is going on <laughs> but we were, we were winning games yeah. we just kept winning games and it was Leicester away when he went and again he said how did we know about it we didn't Paul Franklin was his assistant I think it was a live game on Sky I think it was a Sunday game so uh, we were at the hotel in Leicester and Paul Franklin said lads we've got a team meeting at uh, uh, nine o'clock in the morning on the Sunday and we didn't normally do that with Martin we normally do it the day before and so we all go down thinking, what's going on here? We've got a game this afternoon at like half one or whatever it was. And he called the meeting and he said, look, the manager's left. He's, he's leaving. He's gone. Um, he said, I'm taking the team today. 
the team's the same as it is, you know, and we'll talk about it later. And ironically, Martin left to go to Leicester. But yeah, he, there was no farewells, there was no cuddles and shaking the hands. He just went. What was the reaction from the players? Well, we were open mouthed because you know didn't know what had happened. We've since learned what happened. You know, he wanted to bring in Dean Windass, and that was the final straw, I think, with him. You know, that's that's for Martin to say. But yeah, it was. You know, we we left us. We were flying. We probably, uh, I think, you know, you can never assume, but I think we probably would have gone up that year if he'd have stayed, because he wouldn't have allowed us to take a foot off the gas, as we subsequently did. Um, and he went on to have great success with Leicester, and then you know Celtic, and wherever he's been, he's done really well. And yeah, who knows what would have been? But I, my guess is the team, how we got us playing that year, and the results we were getting, we probably probably would have won the league that year and gone up. Yeah, there was a lot of positivity about, I, I, I was only an 11 year old, but I do remember it at school, everyone getting excited again about the football. Do you think perhaps the managerial comings and goings over those years meant that, you know, the team could never really settle and perhaps yeah, that's yeah, why we yeah. lingered in? It, it can't, you, you know, you uh, to, to, get, uh, to get success and a team playing the way you want them to play um, and the right way and the, and the way that fans appreciate, which here at Norwich has to be attacking football, has to be. You know, you've got to entertain. You've got to go and score goals. Um, you've got to have time to do that. You can't just you can't just throw it together and it happens. And obviously, as a result of changing managers, you know, year in year out, naturally, then that can't happen. You know, you might hit a you might get lucky, but normally you've got to you've got to sort of work with it. And you know, managers these days, you don't get that chance. You know, you don't get that opportunity to do that. It's results driven, and that's it. Um, but we're talking, you, like you've got Daniel here now. Daniel Falk has been here. Someone said to me the other day, you know, where he was on the longest yeah. serving. It's, it's incredible. In the it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really you know, there. And, well, you can see what he's doing. You know, you can see the football he's playing. You know, and it, it can't be done instantly, but he's he's got the team playing the way he likes, the way the, fo the supporters like. And, you know, this, that's brought success. And it's no coincidence for me, you know, but... You know, it's it's chicken and the egg. Unless you're given that chance, you can't do it. But if you don't do it, you won't get that chance. Is there ever a situation, and did you experience it at Norwich, where a new manager gets announced and the players kind of go, no, I'm not having him? And did that happen in the 90s at any point? I think, yeah, I think I'd be lying, Dan, if I said players don't, of course. They, they want to know who it is, what he's done, where's he been. You then phone up all the players that you know have worked with them and you find out about them and you... So you've got a preconceived idea before they come through the door of what it's going to be like. You know, is he going to be a taskmaster? Is he going to be really tough? Is he going to be a friendly one? So you always you always do your sort of your research on that. But then you find out you find out about it for true when they when they step onto the training ground and and into the changing room. And that's quickly when you find out how it's going to be, how it has to be, because then there's only you know if, if people disagree with it, there's only going to be one winner, and that's always the manager. So you either conform or, as a lot of players have found out, then you quickly get shipped out. It must be hard with players that are reg in the regular starting lineup that do have a good rapport and a good relationship with the manager. For that manager to then leave, it's kind of probably a case of, right, building the blocks again. How do you, did you ever have that where you're thinking, oh, I need to impress the next manager when I had a good relationship yeah, with Stay O'Neill before? It's twofold almost. You've got probably half the dressing room are, are gutted because the manager's gone because he's been picking you week in, week out. And you've got the other half who weren't thinking, brilliant, it's a new start, it's a clean slate, the new guy coming in, he might like me. Uh, and that's always how it is. And, you know, managers will normally come in and say, look, it's a, we'll wipe the slate clean, everyone's got a chance, which is not really true because, yeah. you know, they know as well. <laughs> They've done their research before they arrive of the players and, you know, it's, it's never really a, a, a clean slate. You know, you've got an opportunity for sure to go and impress a new manager who might actually think you could do something for his team that the previous manager couldn't but yeah it's a it's always a it's always difficult in the in the changing rooms because as I say the ones that are have been playing regularly now are probably been brought down a peg or two and the ones that haven't been and maybe think now I can roll my sleeves up now and really get a chance to go and impress this guy. Who was your favourite manager to play under? Um, the, and I could I could take the easy one here of saying you know they're all they're all different and they and they and, 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 and they really all are. Mike Walker I would say was the most enjoyable to play for um, and sometimes that cannot be a good thing because if you're enjoying yourself and laughing and joking then doesn't doesn't respond to what's happening on the pitch. But Mike proved here certainly in his first spell, you know he was a good manager. Um, but my, all the players liked him. You know, you had a you had a bit of fun with Mike. He, you know, he'd come out and have a beer with you when 
you know, when you when you were allowed to. He was one of those times. Different times. Yeah. Very <laughs> different <laughs> times. <laughs> yeah, not, not before a game, but <laughs> maybe after. But yeah, Mike would, yeah. And, and that wouldn't be, this is a bit weird. The manager's here drinking with us, you know. We, and Howard Kendall is another one like that, Everton, who, you know, I could talk about him for, for hours and, and that team spirit you talked about. Howard would love coming out with the players for a drink. Mike did. Um, and I think players, naturally, anybody will, they'll, you'll have a, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a secret admiration for that. You're thinking, you know, he's a good guy, this guy, you know, we want to do well for him, you know, he's, he's looking after us, we've got to do it for him. And I think that's that was part of the success of, you know, Mike's, Mike's managerial, you know, his ability and the success he had. But, of course, there's others that you don't like, for sure. Any names? Um... Uh, I wouldn't be disrespectful enough to say I didn't like him because I got on really well with him. But Bruce Rioch, when he came in here, certainly, because we talk about styles again, sort of similar to the Martin O'Neill, who Bruce was regimented. You know, he was, he came from, I think his, his father was uh, like a sergeant major in the army. So you know what yeah. type of upbringing Bruce has had. Discipline, yeah. discipline. And we know, we knew when he was coming in, we knew what had happened at Arsenal. He'd upset one or two of the players with the regime there, I think. There was rumours that they had to turn up collar and tie every day, and wow. players are like, "What?" <laughs> and I don't know if it's true or not. You'd have to ask the Arsenal, but we didn't do that here. But we thought, you know, when Bruce came in, this is going to be collar and tie every day, uh, and it wasn't that. He came in, he's, but he said no baseball caps because that was a bit of a thing at the time. Shell no, suits? No, that was a bit. No base. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was eighties. Yeah, so it's a bit later. But no baseball caps. No, no, you know, no mobile phones. Nothing at all. You know, so there was a bit of discipline there. Don't want anyone being late. Anyone be is late, you're in big trouble. You know, so he brought that sort of discipline to the to the training ground, and um, I got on really well with him. I liked having chat with him because he'd been a fantastic player himself. He talked a lot of sense. He was a very good coach, uh, and he was a very good coach for me in what I th feel is uh, what is what is the characteristics of a very good coach, someone on the pit, on the training ground, who can get his points across concisely, quickly and to the point rather than waffling on and on and on because I've seen it with, with coaches, you know, I want you to do this. If he does that, you do that and then you come and do that and then he, and you, you, you lost interest. Bruce would come and go, open out, back foot, plate down the line, boom, that's, you know, got it. You know, and give players one, two, three bits of information, no more. So you knew your job. And I thought it was really good. But, you know, didn't didn't endear himself to a lot of the players because they'd been maybe used to a bit more familiarity, a bit more friendly. And all of a sudden, Bruce was no nonsense. And I can remember one occasion, Keith O'Neill, the left winger, who's a great lad, Keith, and Bruce wanted him to do this one thing in training. He said, I want you taking him on on the outside. And we actually stopped the session just for this one bit. So someone played him a ball and he said, go on, go at him. And he came on the inside. He went, no, 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 I want you to do it on the outside. So we did it again and he played it out and he came in. He said, no, 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 I want you to do it on the outside. And this, this went on for like seven, eight, nine times. And we're thinking, is Keith trying to wind him up here? <laughs> just, Bruce is going to kill him in a minute. Yeah. And, and he didn't lose his cool at all. He just said, no, we'll do this till till it's done. You know, whether we have to be here till nine o'clock tonight, but we will do it. And he got it done and he went, that's it. That's what I want and moved on. And you think... You know, some players might not, not not respond to that. So I wouldn't say that I didn't like him, um, but it's just a different sort of atmosphere with certain types. And you knew where you stood with Correct. him, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a good thing. I think get the balance right, you know, get a bit of the, f the friendliness with a bit of the discipline. That's probably what, like, a Jurgen Klopp, a Jose yeah. Mourinho, you know, the best that there's been and is. You know, I don't know how they work. I don't know these people spoke to Jose briefly, played against Jose, obviously with, with Norwich and his manager. But I would imagine going and working for someone like a Jurgen Klopp must be, you know, the players must want to, can't wait to get out of bed in the morning. And you he's know, so popular, even with the players that aren't necessarily in his starting seven each yeah, week. And that tells the story for itself. Spot on, Alice. And that's what that, that's exactly what I was going to say, because I, think, I, I would imagine, and I say I've never spoken to Jurgen, don't know him at all. I would imagine he can be hard, when he needs to be, but I, we, we can all see he can be your best mate. Yeah. You know, he's cuddling his players when they're coming off. They they love him. He loves them. But I would imagine, you know, if they step stepped out of line, he would yeah. be. I think he would have the the, the complete mix, the magic. Yeah. Mourinho would be very similar. I would I would think. You know, Mourinho comes across. Have you watched as, the documentary? Yeah, I've seen it all. Yeah. yeah, he comes across. I would imagine totally different than how he is. You know, yeah. he's got his his PR, his media face. And I'm pretty sure he's 
different behind the uh, behind the training ground fence. There's certain managers. I mean, I had a head teacher like it as my only <laughs> um, frame of reference. Is where they weren't necessarily, you know, incredibly strict. There was no fear there, but you just didn't want to let them yeah. down because they were good people. Mm. You, you know, they yep. had a real vision and they cared. You could tell they cared about you. And then you wanted to make them happy. Yeah, and yeah. and I think that's a real skill. And, and that that correct. And it, it's you know we we all know that's what you need to do, but try and do it. That's that's the key, and that's why Mourinho's and Klopp's and. You know, all the man in Sir Alex Ferguson's, that's why they were as good as they were, because they managed to do that. They managed to have a bit of everything that appealed to, to you know, you've got 25, 30, 35 elite athletes there. You know, they're all different. You've got to, how, how, do, you, how do you keep yeah. them all on side, if you like? How do you keep them all with you? And that was the, the magic of that. And fantastic people, like I say, you know, Klopp is the, he's the current, He's the golden boy at the minute. He's your favourite. <laughs> but but I tell you what, when he comes on the TV and for an interview, I bet everybody wants to watch and listen. You know, I'll just see what he's going to say now. He's one of those like Mourinho almost was back when he came when he first came to Chelsea. You know, he was brilliant, wasn't he? Everyone wanted to see what he was saying. He always had something for the press guys, didn't he? You know, they were they were sort of waiting with the with the you know saliva dripping down. Think, what's he going to give us? Um, I was gutted when he left United because it's like not to have him in the Premier League. But I love seeing his, um, you know, pre-match press conferences and everything. <laughs> exactly, so it's yeah. great to have him back. I was gutted when he when we played against them um, yeah. when I was manager of the, yeah, the Premier yeah. League. I was gutted at the end of the game because he went off. He didn't shake my hand. Why? Yeah, I was devastated because I mean, what? if we got a little bit of a backstory, so I think it was almost a year to the day, or it was very very close previously where we'd won the FA Youth Cup yes, against yeah, Chelsea yeah. at Stamford Bridge. Um, and A.D. Vivash was the Chelsea youth team coach. So the, the dugouts at Chelsea, they're, they're quite close. You know, you're only about 10 or 12 feet away from your opposite number. So A.D. Vivash was there obviously on the night of the Youth Cup. And then almost a year later, I'm back in the technical area, a first team Premier League game, and Jose Mourinho's there. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like, wow, I'm pitting my wits against this guy now. Um, so yeah, I mean, one of the best there was. But the game finished. We, we drew the game. We played really well. Um, he wasn't happy because I think it pretty much put pay to their chances of winning the league and Champions League or whatever it was. Uh, so at the end of the game, you know, he, he just went off. He went off down the stairs. How down the rude! Top. Well, I was I was a bit I was yeah, pretty disappointed. Shake, yeah. Shattered my illusions of the yeah. charismatic but, but, Jose. But, so I go on the pitch and I'm shaking our players' hands and the referee's hand and all of a sudden I see Jose come marching back across the pitch and mm. he's coming towards me and he came up to me and went, really good game today. Really, really well. He said, I'm sorry, I, I went off, I forgot. He needed his hand gel. Shit, shit my hand. <laughs> <laughs> shit my hand and I thought, oh, brilliant. You know, I yeah, thought, fair right. play, you know, first of all, gone from thinking, you know, you've just gone down so much in my estimation here to he's obviously gone down there because his mind's probably boiling and... He's think, God, I've not shaken the coach's hands. And not thought, I'll wait, come back out onto the pitch, sink me out, came over to me and congratulated me. And I thought, well, that pretty much sums up what I thought you were all along. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that because that's yeah. what I thought of him. No, me too. Um, coming back to you, am I right in thinking you retired from playing in 2001? Was injury a little bit behind that? Yeah, my, my crucial unfortunate. I'd gone back to, to Oldham. I, I went to, I was about, I think it was 30, nearly 36 at the time. Um, I was coming to, the, obviously coming to the end of my career. Uh, Oldham had wanted me to, had offered me another year um, we were talking about another year, so I would have gone to almost 37, 38 then. Wow. And I was sort of umming and ahhing because see, so I was approaching 36 years old when the, when my contract would have finished, I'd have been 36. If I'd have done another year, I'd have been 37, going to 38. And I'm thinking it's just it's hard because when you get to that age, you know, sometimes you, you, you never lose your quality. You know, sometimes it's tough injury-wise. Uh, and it got to that stage where after every game, it, it would take me two, three days of you know, icing yourself. There's always, it's really, you're really sore. You're, you're in, yeah. It's painful. Uh, that and must people, affect your life as yeah, well. Yeah, it, it, it does. It's just like you play Saturday, you know Sunday you, you're going to be so pain, sore. It's going to be, something's going to be, it's going to be hurting. Um, and this is not a sob story because people say you're playing pro football here. What you, but still, if, you, if you're in pain for Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it's not fun. There's no fun. So I'm thinking, you know, I don't know whether I can do this, you know, and I'm, I was thinking so selfishly, and I'll tell you why when I get to what happened with my injury, I'm thinking, no, I'm 
pretty much gonna I'm gonna hang my boots up at the end of this season. I'm done. I don't really want to sign a new contract. I think that's me. Uh, and this is in the August September. So, you know, I've got a year to run on my contract. They want me to sign a new one. And we were playing at Stoke away, ironically, where you know I started my career. Um, Stoke against Oldham, and I we had a corner kick. I was always on the edge of the box for my corner kicks. Hopefully, if it got headed out, I'd have a shot. Um, and as the ball got headed out, I ran on to, I thought I'm going to hit it. It was just outside the box. And as I ran, I heard a big crack in my leg and went down. And I thought, first of all, someone had hit me in the back. But the crack I heard and the pain I felt in my knee as I hit the floor, I thought, initially, my, my leg is badly broken here. The pain was unreal for about 90 seconds, two minutes, unreal pain like you've never known. And I didn't want to look at my leg because I'd heard the crack. I thought that's a that's a bone going or bones. And I didn't want to look at my leg in case I thought it's going to be all twisted or in a horrible position. But I did, and it was quite straight. I thought, well, and the pain started to ease off a little bit. And I thought, well, I haven't broke my leg. Physio came on and had a look. I said, man, some unbelievable pain in my knee. I don't know what's happened, but I heard a crack. So he... I, sort of helped me off the pitch and asked me to run up and down the line and said the manager wants to know if you can stay on and I'm like this is unreal agony like I've got no chance so they put me on a stretcher took me to the, the changing rooms uh, and then they had a look at it their doctor had a look at it and they always do this like they try and wobble your knee to see if it's a classic ACL test and he said no it seems quite firm you'd be okay sort of thing but I was in such pain and went home that night and my knee ballooned up. There was so much blood at the back of my knee, you know, sort of congregating in, a, in the pocket of the back of your knee, for the want of a better word. And the next day I had a scan and they said, no, you've completely ruptured your ACL. Yeah, I thought you were going to um, say that. It, it was a complete rupture. Horrendous. I said, well, that explains the pain and the swelling. Um, and you're thinking, 35 years old, that's, that's pretty much it. I'm done, you know, and... I'm thinking oh, I'll be okay. I'll get an op. I'll be back. And but my mindset flipped then from uh, I talk about how selfishly I, I was thinking, and I'm now thinking I'm desperate to play football again now because I'm going to be out for six nine months here with this. I can't wait to get back playing football. And then I'm telling myself only like two three weeks ago you were thinking of retiring. And I'm thinking oh, I'm in a bit of pain because of the ice I've got. But you then know, you've not got the option correct. to play because you're out. Correct. For so it was long. taken away from yeah, me, and yeah. now I want just one more game one more game yeah. and it was like how could I even be thinking of yeah. you know hanging the boots up when you know because I was sore after games and now I'm like and I've got a proper injury uh, and this is pretty much me done was that um, a really sad realization yeah. then that it was coming to yeah the, the age was, I was too old too old and you don't come back from an ACL even now I mean again the, the techniques that now you know you get it you get it repaired sort to they let the swelling go down for a couple of weeks then you have an op and six months later you're normally okay um, but not at 35, 36 years old, you know, it's going to be tough then. And that is a huge injury at any age anyway, yeah, isn't it, yeah. to do? But next came media and coaching. Yeah, and and yeah. how did you know what you wanted to do afterwards? Because you've, you've done a lot and are doing a lot now. Yeah. Well, I wanted to be about? a coach um, and I'd, I'd already started to, I'd done all my badges while I was playing, or st some of a, my badges while I was playing because you, you turn 30 as a player. Then when you, t them days you turn 30 as a player, you're like, well, this ain't going to last forever. What are you going to do? So I started to do my coaching badges while I was playing. I'd done my, my, my first uh, badge, then my B licence, and was going on to my A, to my a licence. Um, and now I've done my pro licence. But uh, so you, you get to, to sort of 35 years old, and I, you know, I want to, want to coach. So when, when I got the injury and obviously had to finish, came back down to Norfolk. We kept a house here while we were back up in, in Greater Manchester in Stoke. And uh, came back to our house and I, I spoke to Sammy Morgan, who was the academy manager at the time, um, who Sammy I actually knew well from his playing days at Port Vale. I was a big fan of Port Vale growing up and, you know, I won't go, go into that. But Sammy said, look, you know, come and, come and do some coaching with the academy. Come and get involved. See, see if you like it, you know, see how it works. And that's what happened. So I got a job as, the, as an academy coach and coach for the academy for, for 10 years before I went in full time then as an under 16s then the under 18s and then ultimately onto the first team so I did a lot of coaching and I think it's it's a good it's a good ground in that to go and work with young players under 
12s, under 13s, under 14s, work your way up the ladder, which is what I did. You know, you're learning about structuring sessions, you're learning about tactics, and you know, yes, you've had I had 501 games as a, as a pro, as a player, but it's totally different as a coach. Yeah, you, you would like to think you know a lot about the game, but it's, it's completely different. You're now not thinking as a player, you're thinking of how do I affect a player. Um, but also there was the media as well. Yeah. And the, Canary how, call. How I got into the media was... <laughs> don't say it. Don't Hello, say Neil. It. Yeah, she said it. I wanted to say it. wasn't you, was it? <laughs> I was desperate it wasn't going to be me to say that. Yeah. Thanks, Trevor. <laughs> Where's Barry? He's not in, is he? <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was... Um, if you remember, I don't know if you do remember, BBC Radio Norfolk at the time had Roy Waller was, was yes, a commentator. Yeah, yeah. And what they used to do was get a player, a current player of the squad, helping him out. And it was obviously then whichever player wasn't playing in the game or an injured player. And they'd have a different one sort of every week. And and obviously when I had an injury, I think, whether it was the collarbone, I don't know, whenever it was. And BBC and Roy asked, said, you know, will you do will you do Saturday's game with Roy? And I said, yeah, of course I will. It'll be great, like, rather than just sitting in the stand. <laughs> and obviously enjoyed it. They must have thought, yeah, yeah it was quite good. You know, Loved do you want to do another one? And do you want to do more and more? And so that's how it came about. So when I came back down here doing the coaching at the academy, obviously it's a part-time. You'd only work in Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, Saturday mornings, and then a game on a Sunday. Um, I said, well, why don't you why don't you go and do the games, some of the games, and that's how it grew. Sort of, you know, we I ended up doing every game for like I don't know how long it was, six years or something, like, six seven years, and you know, traveling, watching Norwich every week, and obviously developed it. And I can remember the editor saying to me because we didn't have Canary Court at the time. That <laughs> is is my fault, that. Oh, really? <laughs> because of I brought it. Did you? So, you brought it in. So the the editor Dave Clayton at the time we were talking about okay, you know. And they do. It, they used to do it every year. How do you improve it? What was good? What was bad? What do we take out? And I can remember, obviously, from being up in in the northwest, they all they had they had loads of these phonings, and they were really good. They always they are they're great, aren't they? But they didn't have one down here. And I said, like, why don't you do? Why don't we do like a call in after where the fans phone in and say what they thought of the game? And they're like, oh, we don't know about that. You know, that we never had. I said, I think it'd be a really good idea. You know, sort of twenty minutes, half an hour. You know. If they phone in, they, they do. If they don't, they don't. Scrap it. But I said, I've heard how it, can, how it is in you know the, the radio stations in the Northwest. And you get some right arguments yeah. and banter. Yeah. And yeah. They don't hold back. Yeah. It goes. <laughs> the, the difference being with those up there, they were you've got so many clubs. So yes. you've got like a Manchester radio or you've got 10 clubs there and you get fans of all sorts of clubs phoning in, pretty much like they do now on Talk Sport and yeah. Five Live, you know, phone in. You talk about your team. Whereas obviously BBC Red in Norfolk, everybody is phoning about Norwich. That's yep. it. So they weren't sure how it would go, but uh, they had Amazing. a go at it and <laughs> they're still doing it still now. Still there. <laughs> how was it having that um, relationship with the fans? Was it nice being able to, to speak to the fans? On it, 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 it's really good because fans like every every fan is a manager. You know, yeah, they all yeah, they yeah. all they all <laughs> right. They'll do it their everybody's own way. <laughs> right. Everybody's one hundred percent right. You're always wrong, and and that's how it is, and and always should be, and it's brilliant, but. Yeah, it's some some funny. Some, there were some funny phone calls. One of them when the guy was ranting and raving at the team that had been picked, and I sort of said, "Well, what team would you have picked?" And he named his team, and I wrote it down as he was talking to me. And I looked at it, thought, "That's strange," because he'd named twelve players. And I said, <laughs> do, you want, "Do you want to do you want to name it again? Think of it again." So he named the defenders. So I said, "You've got a back four, yeah, and you've got your midfielders." And I said, "Are you sure that's right?" He went, "Yeah, that's the team that whoever the manager was should be picking." I went, "Well, that's illegal." Picked twelve, <laughs> and he like, "Oh, so, it'll give you a good chance, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, but good it, chance, but, but that, that was funny. I, I sort of gave him the rope to hang himself with, but it was funny." <laughs> the, the iconic Barry Barry's. moment. <laughs> I still have the uh, I turn in, I still turn in the night with Barry. It's, it's sleepless nights. It's, <laughs> in our office, whenever anyone mentions training, they're like, "Yeah, but are they doing that in training?" Neil? <laughs> it was brilliant. Wasn't it? He, 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 the accent as well. He yeah. actually phoned. Uh, I've spoken <laughs> to him since, and we've had good good fun of that. But it was a great call because I think he caught he caught me on a bit of a I, I, I was a bit grumpy that day. I don't know why, but. He was sort of kept pushing too much, and he basically was saying he was having a rant and rave. At, you know why? Why is the centre forward keep being offside? I That's think right, it was. Yeah. Why does he keep running offside? And sort of said whatever about my opinion. Yeah, but you're there every day. You see what they do. You know. And I'm, as I just said, I, would, I used to work at night, 
with the academy teams Tuesday night. So I didn't see what. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to tell Barry this. He wasn't. I went, no, you do. You know, you see it every day. But he went on about six times and I ended up going, you, are you an idiot? What? <laughs> Leading <laughs> like, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not there. So I mean, but yeah, yeah. Good, it was good fun. Yeah, it was one of those where everyone else listening was getting irate yeah. as well. Like Barry, yeah. You're not hearing him. He's not <laughs> there. Everyone's the probably going, session. go on, Barry. Go on, go one on, more, Barry. one more. And he'll, he'll go, he'll crack. How did you find, though, when you're doing that role? So you, you were a club employee as well as, yeah. you know, doing the radio stuff. Was yeah. there ever a time where it's difficult? That so, yeah. You're thinking, yeah. I really want to put the boot in here. Yeah. I've just witnessed an abject Norwich yeah. performance yeah. and I've got to go into work and see these guys. Yeah, cor correct. You're absolutely right. And I would like to think, you know, that I, w I, w I wasn't full of crap. If you like, if you know what I mean, and but you're right. When when a team's not played well, you can't go and say they've played well, just because you know you you you're working for the club. If you like, well, you lose your credibility. Cor if you're just, cor correct. Yeah. So I'd like to think you know there were times people say, "Oh, you're sitting on the fence there," but you've you've got you, you can go so far. I think, and it's getting it right. And and I would like to think anyone listen to those years when Norwich didn't play well. I wouldn't say they did play well. I'd say no, they've not played well today, but. You can you can criticise, but then there'll come a point there where you can't go. But the manager's got to be sacked because yeah. it's impossible. So yeah, it's difficult at times like that when fans, for example, are phoning in and saying, "Oh, he's got to go, he's got to go." I can't go, yeah, because you know you're, you're part of the club. But I would like to think people. I didn't sort of didn't lose the integrity in in saying, "Oh no, they were fantastic today." You don't know what you're talking about. The manager's a genius. I never said that when it clearly wasn't. The case, it's balance, but you it? but you can't obviously you go you can't go and point a gun to you know someone you're working with that's that's just not right. Well, and maybe say, maybe did... people might say, yeah that that that's probably why it didn't work if you like people didn't like that. You know you get an independent person and he can say what he likes and some people might like that. But I'd like to think I gave a good insight of what happened and and wouldn't try and pull wool, pull the wool over anybody's eyes. If they didn't play well, I'd say it was a poor di poor display today because it was. Did you ever get the uh, David McNally call into the office on a Monday morning? Neil, I don't know, don't like what you said there over the no, weekend. No, not, not at all. <laughs> let's, let's talk about it. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I can remember Nigel once. Um, I, had a, I was having a chat with Nigel, Nigel Worthington. Um, and he, said, he, he called me into his office one day and sort of said, one of the players' um, wife has got the ump with you. Of oh dear, that is some, not good person to <laughs> How have you managed that? Because there's something I'd said, obviously, about uh, the player, her, hus the her player? husband, I forgot to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, th I think it was Svensson, <laughs> oh, the okay. centre forward. Okay. The, yeah. the centre forward. And I'd, I'd probably had a pop at him, you know. Again, knowing full well that I'd not gone over the overboard on it, but probably just said he's, he hasn't done, he hasn't played well today. He's and got to be better than that. Happy. The wife had not happy. It got back to Nigel, and Nigel came and said, look, I don't know what you said, but... <laughs> Centre forward is not happy, like, because his missus is <laughs> giving him <laughs> giving him pelters at home. That's so brilliant. I sort of said, well, you know, and he sort of said, look, you know, he said, I, I know you know what you're talking about and that, but I, you know, I said, well, I don't know what I've said, but tell her know, not to the, listen. There's nothing, you know, if he and Nigel probably, yeah, it was it was terrible. I said, well, <laughs> I would have said nothing more than that. But it's almost like marking your card to sort of say, you know, but be careful, you know, you can't go in on people or which. Yeah, it's unwritten rule, of course. Um, but a few weeks later, you know, there was another game and I was saying something about it and Nigel actually came up and said, I really appreciate how you sort of dealt with that and managed it. And, you know, he says, look, I don't want you to say we've been great when we've not and be as critical as you like, but, you know, just be just bear in mind, be careful. Was he listening every week then? No, I, d I don't think he was, but I think... He gets back. It gets back, yeah. like you say. If something's said, anything that's pretty strong or, you know, it soon gets around the football mm -hmm. club, you know, yeah. as it would deny anything in the press, anything, you know, that's said on Radio Norfolk now. If someone's really said something a bit steep, then it'll quickly get back to everybody. Yeah. So onto your coaching career, um, the under-18s you obviously had huge success with initially, um, winning the Youth Cup in 2013, you touched on it earlier, against Chelsea. How did that feel? What was that like? It, it was, yeah, it was brilliant, obviously, at the time because I'd done the... Like I say, I'd, I'd, I'd been coaching with the academy for a good 10 years and then took the under-16s the previous year and we won the, the Premier League tournament um, and then obviously moved up to the 18s. Was that uh, a big jump? Um, yeah, it, it is because the, the under-16s, you're dealing predominantly with players that are schoolboys, whereas the under-18s are then full-time scholars, stroke pros. So it's, it's, it's every day then. You know, the 18s is a full-time... Monday to Friday, play on a Saturday. The the under sixteens is, is you know 
two, three nights a week and maybe some days. So that that was the difference with that. But obviously the 18s group at the time, we we had a we had a good group of players. We didn't have a brilliant group of players that were, you know, everywhere they won the FA Youth Cup because they had the best players. I mean, you look at the Chelsea team we played in the final, there's Nathan Ake's and Ruben Loftus Cheeks and you know, played these players have gone on and and were at the time and we had we had you know, a Norwich under-18 team. Murphy Twins? We had the Murphy Twins and we had Carlton up front, which was which gave us something. And He was almost a, a man playing in the sort of kids' game, wasn't he? Yeah, was... um, we, we, but what we were, we were very organised. Mm-hmm. And the, the beauty of the, the FA Youth Cup is that you get time between the games. It's Obviously, you're playing your 18s games, your league fixtures on a, on a Saturday, but... It doesn't really matter about the 18s league table, but the FA Youth Cup matters. So you can sort of focus on game to game and you've got like then probably three, four weeks between the third round to the fourth round to the fifth round. So you can really focus on it. And that's what we did. We did, you know, really studied the opposition. I gave tactical details to the players. That, And the good thing for me is the players then fed back and I've done since saying how detailed the coaching was that they knew almost exactly what they were coming up against and we had to because yeah we had the two Murphys and Carlton but we had you know didn't have superstars beyond them if you like and that's not being disrespectful to to the rest of the players because they've gone on and won an FA Youth Cup they've been brilliant and are all playing now professionally um but we had to we had to be make sure that we knew exactly what we were doing the you know we and we got it spot on you know we did the, we did the research we did the the video analysis we we coached them on the pitch and obviously we had a we had a fantastic run mm-hmm. unbelievable night at carrot was it 20 21 20, 000? i think there's only 22 i yeah. can i can remember uh, dan that the semi final was against forest and i think we got nine ten thousand in that but before the forest game you know you're playing in front of 200 people if that um birmingham millwall there was qpr we played here there was you know 10 men and a, and a dog over in the the gerald stand the south stand uh, but the Forest game, the word got round and back to me that this, there could be a few in tonight. So we're thinking it'd be great if there's a couple of thousand in for the Forest game. Uh, and then they said, no, we've sold at least four or five thousand. So thinking there could be six or seven on walk-ups if it's a nice night. And now I'm thinking this could be interesting because this could affect the players one or two ways. Here. These players have never played in front of anybody. All of a sudden they walk out and there's like 10,000 fans there. It might throw everything out the window that we've we've worked on because of the pressure. And it had the absolute reverse effect. They absolutely loved it. Yeah. Was, was it penalties the Forest? Yeah. Went to penalties, yeah. yeah. I, was, and, you, I, was uh, I was here, yeah. Yeah, it was amazing, wasn't it? it went, yeah, we, we scored all the pens, yeah. pleasingly for me. I was just quite pleased. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> off the old block, yeah. Um, but the players came in and said the fans were brilliant. That's, we loved it. So we knew when we when we won that game, then the final, there was going to be more than 10,000. It was pretty obvious. So I'm, I remember speaking to the players and the staff thinking, I, I'm thinking there's going to be 15,000 here. And... People are going, maybe not that many. And then it just went mad. And I think it was 21, 22, something like that. It was full. The ground was full, bar the top two tiers of the Barclay and the River End. It was full. And for a for a youth team game, is it's unheard of. It's like, it just doesn't happen. Um, but they absolutely loved it. And I can remember, as I say, we played Chelsea. If anyone watches the game back, they, they, broke, they nearly scored in the first minute, Chelsea. Um, one of the players went through and Karl McFadden makes a, makes a brilliant slide tackle. It was a certain goal. And as I can remember the guys going through and I think if he scores here, this is going to end up seven or eight. This could be a bit humiliating. You know, it's live on TV. You've got 22,000 fans here. You don't want to get beat six, seven, nil at home, you know, because the second level's irrelevant. And we, we weathered the storm. We, we obviously won the first game one nil, but still everybody's saying, no, oh, Chelsea's going to smash them second second leg. But again, um, driving down to Stamford Bridge, I can remember the, the look on the players' face. We used to put on, I, I like used to put on like motivational videos as we were approaching the ground um, to get the players, you know, wanting to get off the bus with the sleeves rolled up. And we just saw this row after row after row of the, the yellow coaches, supporters' coaches. And we're thinking, oh my God, like, you know, this, and, you know, 20, 30 or more. So straight away, the players are, oh, yes, come on, like, we're going to have some fans here. And there was about three and a half thousand, which is as many as we took Absolute a year standards. later <laughs> against Jose Marino's yeah. Chelsea in, yeah. the, in the Premier League. You know, it was full. It was, it was fantastic. So I think there's about 17,000 in Stamford Bridge. But you got three and a half thousand fans shouting and singing all through the game. Players loved it again. And 
the pleasing thing for me with the FA Youth Cup win is we beat them both both legs home and away. So it wasn't a fluke. You know, you, anyone could beat anyone. You know, Chelsea were probably the best team, better team on the night here against us, but we were the better team. That, but we won both games, so no one could say you got lucky. Whereas if it had been one leg, you know, but we went down to Stamford Bridge, we conceded an early goal, and yet we still won the game 4-2, which was, was excellent. Um, and then less than a year on, you were then manager of Norwich. Um, obviously, Chris Hewton had left and we weren't in a great position at the time. How did it feel taking over knowing that there was a bit of a struggle going on there? Yeah, there was the last five games of the season and I had no idea, no idea at all that it was going to happen. I think they played the, the game at home. Was that the West Brom? Or it was West, West Brom. Yeah. West it Brom. was yeah. probably the most toxic yeah. caravan. I, 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 I was at the game. I was at the game. I was at the game. Was in my, my friend um, as a, one of the boxes behind the, the River End. So I was at the game and uh, and saw the match, uh, saw the, the defeat, and obviously it was it wasn't great. You know the the atmosphere wasn't great, but not for one minute did I any, any inclination that I was going to be taking the next five games and got the call the next day to come down here to Cow Road to see David McNally at the time. Um, Did still, you know what that would be about? You've got a pretty good idea then, haven't yeah. you? You've got, you're thinking, well, I'm not being called down here for nothing. You know, there's, there might be a chance of this. Um, but wasn't given really any forewarning of it. So you're thinking, OK, you've got to be prepared for whatever might get said. Best suit on. It might be, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> sort of. Um, and yeah, went to see David and we chatted for five, ten minutes, and I'm thinking, you know, are you going to ask me a question here or is, is this all it is sort of thing? Um, and he sort of obviously said to me, look, we wanted to take the last five games if, if, if you want to do that. Um, and said, but we know it's a poison chalice. We know pretty much you got no chance, you know, because the fixture, because of the fixtures was, I think it was the Fulham on the Saturday, but then it was Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal, Man United. He was like, and all those teams at the time were, were, were up there. It's not, you know, like a Man United now, yeah. I know they're, they're, they're struggling a little bit as we speak. Did but, that ease the pressure in a way then? If you were told, we know it's probably not going to yeah. happen, was that better? Well, it did, didn't really ease the pressure because your personal pride, you don't want to yeah. lose, you don't want to lose games. And this is going to be the most difficult, for, probably four of the most difficult games of the season. You know, Liverpool at the time were going for the Premier League, as you remember, that was the year Gerrard slipped. Yeah. And yeah. when they came to Cow Road, we had a great game against them, 3 2. and you know, Brendan was the coach. I spoke with Brendan, who was brilliant about, you know, uh, if you want to talk about it, I will do, but um, the, these teams, and then Chelsea was Jose's team, Arsenal was Arsene Wenger's team, and you're thinking, crikey. And Manu was the first gigs. <laughs> well, this is the thing, yeah. I mean, David Moyes had been there before, and you're thinking, can you get five more difficult games? It's pretty much impossible. You know, you've got Jose Mourinho's Chelsea going for the title and Champions League. Liverpool going for the title. Arsenal were in the top four. And you're thinking, well, at least Man United are struggling under David Moyes. We maybe might have a chance there. <laughs> yeah. David got sacked, I think, two, three days oh, before yeah. the game. Unlucky. <laughs> OK, who are they bringing in? Ryan Giggs. <laughs> My head hit the floor. 80,000 Man United fans Correct. just amped up. And, and you know, it's gonna be, it was like a circus when we came yeah. out. There. You know, Dave, Ryan Giggs is a legend there, you know. And I know Ryan. I know Ryan from the plane. We, we we know each other. We speak to each other. And had you spoken before the game? Then? Not before the game, but we spoke on the way to the to the pitch and and afterwards. And Giggsy said to me, "It was funny when we shake hands. You see it because we we saw you see me laugh and smile, and that's because Giggsy says I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, so, but but he's got eighty thousand fans worshiping yeah. him. And as you can imagine, you know they've gone from a team struggling a week before." when David Moyes was there to think, we're thinking we could get about these, we can maybe win this game to the Man United of like absolutely flying. You know, it was, it was unlucky. It was really unlucky that it happened on that day. But you would have had a similar sentiment when you took over because you know, you're one of ours. This, yeah. this is one of our guys. I remember I, I was at the Fulham game. Um, I remember you walking out from that corner yeah. and sort of having a glance towards the fans and yeah, yeah, the warmth. That it, was. Well, it meant it meant a lot. It means a lot because this, this is my club, isn't it? You know, I've been like we've talked about it. Been here twenty six years. You know, I've been here as a player, as a coach, a manager. Now as a loans manager, but but as a fan as well. You know, you you still want the team to to do well, and you know to be sort of accepted like that. And I just felt that knowing full well these day, these games are going to be so, so difficult. You know, you probably... Fulham was a, a, a good opportunity. That was our only chance, really. Mm. And we played really well, certainly for the first 
45 minutes, we were excellent. I feel like Ricky Van Walsingle <laughs> should have scored. Is that the right game? Yeah. It, that was probably said it, a few it times. Was a, yeah. it, was, it, was it was a bit of a theme of the season. It was a brilliant save. Bradley Johnson should have scored. We hit the bar. We, we murdered them first half. Yeah, I remember. Felix McGath, the manager, said after he said, look, we couldn't live with you. I played a dime and they weren't expecting that. And we ripped them apart first half. They went in actually 1-0 up. Second half was more of an even game. We couldn't score. I think Snoddy missed the... He slid in and missed an open goal oh, yeah. at the end, and it was and that was pretty much. That's the difference. You couldn't ask for any more, but that was it. That yeah. was pretty much done. You've now got Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal, Man United. Game, game over. But in terms of going back to David said, you know, do you want to take it? No brainer, absolute no brainer. Who turns down an opportunity to manage in the Premier League with with your club? You know, so yeah, you're probably there now to just go and get five good hidings. As it was, it wasn't pleasingly and. Some of the performances, particularly Chelsea away, Liverpool at home, where I'll never forget it till the day I die, the Liverpool game, you know, they are flying. Gerrard's pulling all the strings. They've got Coutinho, Suarez, Sterling up front. You know, it's it's a tough, tough game. I'm assuming Suarez probably scored. In yeah, that game. of course he yeah, did. Of course he did. <laughs> he loved scoring against Doesn't Tom he Ruddy, didn't he? And they went, they went, they went 2-0 up early on after ah, about 10, 11 minutes. And I had to change it really quickly and pride myself on doing that because it could have froze and just given up but I thought this could end up six now we've got to do something we changed it after 10 minutes not that we picked the wrong formation but it wasn't working so we changed it we got back into the game we got back to 2-1 Brendan then changed it they went to 3-1 up we then changed again got back to 3-2 and the last five minutes was kitchen sink where I think we hit the post I might be wrong with that and Gary Hooper I think it was had a half a chance to equalize and we lose the game 3-2 and the whole of Car Road stood up and applauded. And you're thinking, OK, we've lost the game, but they they like what they've seen. And for me, that was just as much as important as anything, really, because I said when I got the job and subsequently when I took it for the, the start of the next season, you know, we will play attacking football. This is what we... This is, this, is, this is me. This is what we will do. We won't change from that. We'll try and entertain. We want to score goals and... You know, looking back on what, what that's what we did. You know, the results, some of the results, obviously weren't, weren't weren't good enough. You know, we we played Rotherham, I think, at home. Uh, one game we drew one one. We had like sixty five percent possession, twenty seven shots, but scored one. Yeah. And ultimately, you can throw the sixty five percent possession away and the twenty seven shots away. You scored one goal, and that's what you judged on. But the football was was equally important to me. And five nil, six one wins. In my last two home games here, that's that that was what we we did. But ultimately, you know, you've got win you got win football games. But that was why it's so pleasing for me to to get the to see the, the supporters reacting. That okay, we've just been beaten three two by a, a team that's pretty much going to win the league as we thought at the time, um, and we've just given them a right good game and a right good go after obviously you know, a, a season in which. The football hadn't been as, as entertaining, let's shall we say, as, as the fans wanted it to be. And you said Brendan Rodgers had some words for you. He, he was brilliant um, because after we were in the in the manager's lounge, and I said, "Come in and speak to me after." And he said, "Look," he said, um, and, "and managers sometimes will say things. It's easy to say things when you've won. It's easy to be, yeah, you, know, you were brilliant as well." And but I just knew at the time Brendan was speaking the truth, just the way he delivered it, and the person he is. He sort of said, "Look," he said, "you were fantastic today." He said. You really, really tested us tactically and obviously with everything about your game in the way you changed. And he says you weren't afraid to change in game. You didn't have to wait till like 75 minutes when we'd have been probably 6 nil up. You know, you did it early and a lot of people, he says, straight away you change a game in the Premier League after you change your formation after 12, 13 minutes and it goes wrong then. And guess what? The press are coming for you. So you don't know what you're doing here. You know, you've picked the wrong team. You've then changed it and it hasn't worked. You're in big trouble. So it's a big risk. But I went with it. And he said, it, it takes a lot, that. And he said, you really, really gave us a problem. Um, he says, so just just carry on. Keep doing that. He said, because that's, that's what I did. You know, he said, he came through the youth systems. And so when, when we finished, when, when I've gone home, I'm thinking, you know, is he just saying that? Is that like, was that just nice words from him? And then someone told me that Brendan... They'd been on a course at St George's Park on a, co a coaching course, and Brendan Rogers had spoken on it, and he said he actually mentioned he was talking about tactics on the I think it was a B license or something, and this person said to me he said he, he was talking about tactics tactics, and he said one of the most difficult tactical games I ever had 
was against Norwich about, and this was about, like he said, about four years ago. There you go. He said, and this was the game he's talking about, and I'm thinking, ah, he was genuinely being yeah. honest and truthful when he, we spoke after the game. He, and, and he went on to say, he said, he talked about how the opposition manager changed after, re, you know, because we were 2-0 up and they put us on the back foot, they got back into the game, and then he thought, I've got to do something about this. And he said, and then they responded again, and he said, we had a great game of football. He said, but... It was really, really tough, and I thought really appreciated it. Yeah. But I was right with my judgment when, when I just sort of can quite, quite a good gauge of people when they're talking to. I knew at the time he was being genuine and sincere, uh, but it was really nice to hear it backed up by someone who didn't know that I knew that. Yeah, it's amazing to yeah. hear that. Is. And I guess you could then take that feedback on. Obviously, we were then relegated the next season, um, but I guess you could use all that kind of as positives and, and getting yeah. that win at Portman Road as well. That must have <laughs> been a, a biggie. <laughs> Did we win that? I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> I dream about it every night. Yeah. I no. generally have videos on my phone that occasionally watch again. It's so of, co of course, it meant, it meant so much. I remember it was a live Sky game, being interviewed after the game and just saying to them, they said, like, what does it mean to you? And I said, well, I know what it means to me but I also know what it means to the supporters and to the players and to the families because I've you know I've pl I said I'd played in so many of these games I think someone dug up the stats and I played in eight uh, East Anglian derbies and we won seven or something like that we'd always had success against them and I said I know now what these two I think it was two and a half thousand at Portman Road I said but there's, there's 25,000 back at Carrow Road yeah. who can't be here but I know what sort of a weekend they're going to have now they're going to be absolutely Unreal. buzzing so my reactions at the end of the game are sort of partially fueled by, yeah, we just won an East Anglian derby and I'm the manager, fantastic, but let's, I've got to go over to the fans now here because I can't just go down down the, the touchline because it's obviously on the opposite side at Portman Road to the to the tunnel that's in the corner. There's two and a half thousand fans who are over there who I want to go over and thank every one of them for being here, but share it with them, you know, and so that's where you get those sort of, the scenes where I, oh, I, were great I, I was punching oh, my they? fist. It was incredible. Yeah. That game was the birth of the Hello Neil song <laughs> to, the, to Daddy Cool. Go That's on, right. sing it. Oh, no, I couldn't possibly. But we'd, we'd just gone to the, we were top of the league, just gone to the top of the league, haven't we? You know, after we'd lost at Wolves first game and then we'd beaten Watford, beat Blackburn, and everyone was going, okay, you know, we'd beaten Watford 3 0. I think we'd beaten Blackburn 3 1, maybe 3 1. So we're scoring goals again, which is what I said mm -hmm. we would, you know, this is what we, we need to do. But everyone's going, okay, let's hang on a bit. Let's see what happens at Ipswich first before we make a judgment. And we we won 1-0 at Ipswich, but I think, again, anyone remember, we should have probably won yeah. two or three or oh, maybe four. <laughs> uh, we played really well. You know, we opened them up and the system was good. We made good substitutions at the right time and we've gone to the top of the league. And like I say, the, it, was, it was fantastic just those, even though it was probably, what, 30 seconds over with the fans because you've got to go at some time. You can't stay. <laughs> you can't, We'd have been there all night, don't you worry. <laughs> I made my way off into the uh, into the, the tunnel, did the interview with Sky, and then you go into the changing room and you miss it. You yeah. sort of miss it because by then yeah. the players are, you know, bouncing off the walls. But by the time I got in there, it's, Start to come it's down. 10 minutes later, yeah. And, and you, you obviously had some highs. We talked there about, about um, Portman Road. But w how did it feel when that did then come to an end, your time as, as Norwich manager? How, how did that all come about? It, it, obviously, anything like that is disappointing when you step down from a job because you want, you, want to, you want to be successful. You want to succeed. And it was made pretty clear to me at the start that the team had to be in the top two. You know, that was sort of the remit. You have to be in the top two. We have to go back to a the Premier League. big ask in it, the championship. It, it, it is a big ask. What I will say in, the, in you know, David David's defence is it was made absolutely clear. We need to return to the Premier League. If you look at the other two clubs that came down with us, Fulham and Cardiff that year, I think when we talk about the Ipswich game and soon after that, I think Cardiff were like sixth bottom. Fulham were actually rock bottom and we were top. So... Never really easy for a relegated club to automatically assume you go back to the to Premier League. It's not that That's easy. That's what you see back to back Correct. relegation. Correct. Absolutely. Steady the ship, sort of thing. Make sure it doesn't happen again. And obviously, we did that. We were never, you know, we were looking at, at the top, but and we were top for a long while. You know, we were up there competing. And but looking looking on it, I left. We were when I left, we were seventh in the table. You know, we, I'd put on. A decent enough amount of points for Alex to then come in and to take the team on to what happened. So I look back at it and think, you know, we were seven from top here. Uh, and a lot of people have sort of said to me, 
how does a manager, you know, leave a leave a job when you're seventh? Um, but it was made clear that, you know, we need to be top two now. You'd have to speak to David and 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 you know the board of directors at the time. Um, but I look back at it, and as I just said to you, um, there was there was a period of games, probably October, November, I think, where we were actually playing quite well, but we weren't getting the results. There was a couple of games we didn't play well at all, but there was other games where I can remember saying to the press after one of them, "Look, I can't keep saying we've played really well if we're not winning games because that's just sound same old story." But I said genuinely. If I don't think we've played well, I will tell you. Like I said before, I'm not one for BSing everyone. Um, but there were some games I think, do you know what? I'll take that all day long because we'll smash teams if we get the first goal, blah, blah, blah. And as I just said to you, the last two games I had here at Carrow Road was a 5-0 win and a 6-1 win. Yeah. So Yeah, that must have been weird then, then how it did yeah. end. Being, as you say, being seventh, was it a bit bittersweet then when Alex Neal then came in? Obviously, you want to see them do well, probably, I'm guessing, but seeing him pick up where you left off and then getting promoted via the playoffs yeah. in that way, how did that feel? It must it, have been a bit it, weird. It didn't feel as weird as probably a lot of people would think mm -hmm. because I know a lot of people might think, oh, you must have been hating it when you've seen the team then get to that. Wembley, <laughs> win, win, the, win promotion. I look, I look at it as I played a part in that, yes. a big part yeah, in it, yeah. and without the 37, 40 points, whatever it was that I put on the board with the team, they wouldn't have done that. Yeah. You know, if if we'd have been a Fulham or a Cardiff at the time, then any change, you know, we might finish mid-table, we wouldn't have been in the playoffs. But we had the points on the board for Alex to go on and achieve what they achieved. So certainly for me, when I'm, you know, it, it didn't take long for me. I'm, I'm not one for going to moping, you know, whatever happens, happens. I'm like, okay, let's be positive, let's be strong, let's look at the next thing. And I was genuinely willing the team success, genuinely, because, let's say, 26 years here, you can't, just because, you know, you've stepped down from a role, then you can't sort of, you, you can't hate them. Yeah. Not not for me, for sure. Was and there any element of, like, what could have been? Yeah, that's the thing. You know, watching the watching the final, the playoff final, I was, I was jumping around with everybody else. I was delighted for it. But then you think, Crikey, that could have been me. Yeah, that could that could that could have been me there, yeah. you know. But for but yeah, I doesn't it doesn't you know, like I said, I'm not bitter about it at all, um, and you know, honoured and privileged and proud that I had an opportunity to make the contribution that got the team back into the Premier League. You know, obviously, they slipped out, saying but but we went back and now we're back in the champ and hopefully we're going back again. So, you know, my, things might not happen since what what have happened had that not been the case. Well. What, how did that conversation go with David? Were you under any sort of, did, did you know that you were perhaps, it was in the balance? You, do you think the club were perhaps looking at other people? And then how did that conversation with David take place? Yeah, quite quickly really, you know, and um, of course, you know, when, when you're not winning games in a club this size, you know, you're always going to be under pressure. You're under, people ask me that many times, you know, did you feel under pressure um, when you were manager? So you, you should be under pressure. The, the manager of Norwich City should be under pressure every game. Full stop. If you're not under pressure, then you shouldn't really be here because, and again, no disrespect to other clubs, this is a big, big club. You know, the supporters demand that this should be seen as a big club. They fill the stadium week in, week out. You know, they have done for 20 years or more. They take unbelievable amounts of supporters away from home. So just by that, we are a big club. So you should be under pressure. So obviously when things aren't going particularly well, and you're not in the top two, then you, you're going to be under increasing pressure, under pressure for, for David at the time to, to, to get this right. So it, it happened quite quickly. Um, we talked about the future, about obviously the role I'm in now. Um, yeah, because it wasn't just Neil, there's the door. It's Neil, no, no, absolutely. still one of us. You know, we, it was a conversation. It wasn't like, off you go. It was a conversation. Um, and what intrigued me was like being part of, being part of something in the future and, Obviously, I had to have a think about that and see how it would work because as a loan manager now, there wasn't one at the time. Uh, and so I had to, we had to have a look at would this suit me or you know was was going back into management for me. Uh, I had, I think, four or five offers to go back in. Um, but this intrigued me, this role and this, like I say, I'm part of this club, uh, you know, it's my club. And so come the, the summer, then that's when I, when I started the role again and I've been for the last... 
five, six years. Was it made for you and sort of tailored towards you then, the role? Because obviously you're instrumental yeah. in, in developing talent yeah. here now, aren't you? Just tell us about that job. I think it's it's a role now, Alice, that more and more clubs are, are, are hiring people to do. I think every Premier League club has got a loans manager now. I think probably 50% of the Championship has and some of the other clubs as well. And... I, it came about because when I was when I was manager at the time, we had probably four or five players on loan. And if you'd have said to me at the time, how are them players doing? I'd have had to hold my hands up and go, I don't really know. You know, I phoned them up every other week and how are you doing? How's it going? Great. And you put the phone down. And we thought that's not really the way that you should be doing this. If you're going to be throwing a lot of money at an academy like Norwich does and developing players, then it's got to be... It's got to be spot on. It's got to be done thoroughly and properly, and 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 that way. And that's why, the so that's why the role was created. And like I say, there was no template there. I remember when I was speaking to David again about this, and sort of I remember saying to him, "Okay, so what do you want from me in this role?" And he sort of basically said, "You create it, you develop it, you shape it, and you run it." It was like, "Go on, off you go," because there's there's nothing to follow. And so it's evolved and developed over the years to the point we're at now where I'd like to think we've viewed pound for pound as as good as any uh, at doing this and the success stories we've had with some of the players and not just the ones that have come back to play in the first team or been sold for a lot of money, but players that have gone on to have careers, like we said. It's, it's not all about selling a player for 25 million or getting a player to play for your first team. Of course, that's the priority. It's also for getting a player a career in the game. And so it encompasses all that and, you know, it's, it's really detailed now, the strategies, the philosophies we have and it, it, we've, we've shaped them and moulded them to a point now where we've got a, a proven track record of this is, we know how it works. And that's why when people might frown when they see why is one of our most promising players being shipped out to Holland to play in the Dutch second division? Well, there's an awful lot of research and yeah. study and Doesn't proof. Just and it's proven to work. Todd Cantwell is, is a classic yes. example of, well, why did you ship someone out to Dutch second division? Well, Todd Cantwell's the answer. That's why, because it works. But why, why did you, though? Why not send him to a Rochdale or, you know, a League One or a League Two side? Why send him over to the Netherlands? Uh, the reason, again, it's every player is, is individual. What's right for one is totally different for another. And Todd, and I've spoken at this at length about this and Todd doesn't mind me sharing this with you Todd's always been in Norfolk he's a Norfolk boy he's a Deerham boy Norwich is you know he loves the place he came into the academy at eight I think he's known nothing but Norfolk and Norwich City and Todd now from Todd from two two three years ago is totally different he's different in his mentality he's different in his physical build three years ago he was he was uh, a bit he was a lot skinnier than he is now, a bit more frail than he is, certainly not as strong, mentally tough as he is now. And we needed to toughen him up a little bit, but we didn't need to toughen him up as in throwing him out to a League Two club where he might have got beaten up rather than toughened up. You know, it, we're playing with the ball flying over his head all the time. So the reason we, we put him to the Dutch second division and why we have done with a lot of players since is we know it really well. I know, know the, the football over there really well. And they all play football in the, in the Dutch oh, Eredivisie. Yeah, yeah, second of them. They all play out from the back. They play through the thirds. But it's senior football. So it ticked every box for us in that Todd would be exposed, first of all, exposed to senior football, so the physicality of it. Secondly, he'd be getting the ball into his feet rather than it flying over his head all the time. And he would be seriously involved in games to able to showcase and develop his ability. And thirdly, to a point, to get him out of Norfolk. Mm -hmm out of his comfort zone to go and have to look after himself and, you know, fend for himself, so to speak. And it didn't go well at the start. The loan didn't go particularly well because Todd was a little bit homesick, a little bit out of his comfort zone. And we had a chat, we had a conversation, you know, we had numerous conversations. And I said to him, Todd, I said, look, let's, let's have a little deal here. You know, you, I said, you really throw yourself into this and apply yourself in the next couple of weeks. No phone calls, no... You know, just go and work hard, get yourself into the team. And I said, and if it doesn't work and it's not right, but you've given everything, then we'll get you back. No problem. So we had an, a deal, an agreement, and that's he, he absolutely flew. He, he knuckled down. They had a change of manager. He got into the team and he quickly became their best player. You could see quite comfortably. You know, his technical ability is what you see now. He was absolutely tearing teams apart. 
and he he loved it and the fans loved him and his family were over there watching games i was over there watching games and he realized yeah we're, we're sending you over to holland but we are not going that doesn't mean for one minute you're going to be any less monitored or cared for or spoken to and than, than you would be if you were at colney and he got better and better and better to the point where they almost won the league they lost the league on the last kick of a game but because they were second and Ajax uh, second team won it, they were promoted. So they went into the Eredivisie. Todd was an absolute hero. You know, he was he was singing in the town square and on the open top bus parade. And he obviously came back to us and now has developed into a Premier League England under twenty one international. And that is that is how a loan, a successful loan. That's the you know you've got someone who. You get it wrong if we'd have sent him to a, you know, I won't name a team, but, a, a, you know, kick it and rush the League Two team. We might not have had the, the player we've got now worth however much he's worth, but playing in our in our team. We, we wow, might have lost him. That must be so rewarding. And I also think there's a changing attitude, which I think you've you've made here, in that it used to be you were sent out on loan and players might think, oh, that means, you know, I'm surplus to requirements here. I'm not, you know, the manager's not having me here. But actually, it's kind of been switched around to it now being a compliment in that it's a case of we really value your potential and you could be, you are one for the future. So let's get you out on loan. You know, we've done the research on a team that would really suit you. It, it, has that changed a lot since you've been here doing yeah, this role? Yeah, it, it has, Alice. It took probably probably 18 months, two years to, uh, I say like, we flipped the mentality yeah. here. Like I said to you before, I alluded to when I was the manager, talking about loan players, you, you went out on loan, no, you know, nobody really knew what was happening. Um, and so obviously when I come in now as the loans manager, you can imagine the young players, particularly the younger players, if they saw me, sort of beckoning them over they probably want to run a mile because you're thinking that's me done I'm finished but yeah. and it took a while to to turn that to what it is now where you go out on loan now it's pretty much a well done so far and he's your next stage now he's your next step um similar for the under 23s coach at the time Matt Gill was the coach at the time and Gilly used to hide from me, I'm pretty sure, because <laughs> Don't take any more. every time I came and saw him, I'm taking one of his best yeah. players off him, and he's got he's got to go and try and win games with the under-23s, and all his players are out on loan. But again, flipping that mentality to not that not winning isn't important for the under-23s, but it's not the be-all and end-all. You know, no one, you know, this club isn't going to function by the under-23s winning their league, but what it will do by the amount of money we make on players or getting them back into our team to make us a better, better team. And so that we had to turn not only the players, but also some of the staff as well. And pleasingly, we now, that can only happen if you have a few success stories. And, and of course, we've had that with, with, with a lot of them, pleasingly, to the point now where, you know, players are not afraid of going on loan. They know that that could, well, I can go and be the next yeah. Todd Cantwell, the or next ben Godfrey, Jacob or Murphy, yeah. Josh Murphy, Ben Godfrey, yeah, is another, another great one. James Madison, you yeah. know, type, type who came through this. Um, and, yeah, it's it's good now that we, we feel, like I say, we're, we're, we're punching pound for pound with, with other clubs that have got seven of me. So who do you, who do you report to here? Because obviously you've got Stuart as sporting director, Steve Weaver... Um, and then Daniel as well. Yeah. So, so when you're reporting back to people, who who do you work with? How do you plan out the loans? Stuart, Stuart is you know I work really closely with Stuart. Obviously, Steve Weaver as well as academy manager, um, and Kieran Scott sometimes with recruitment, and I'll speak to Daniel, but mainly Stuart Weber as uh, Stuart and Steve, who who you know obviously Daniel and Stuart will will decide which players and Steve as well if it's academy, which players they they, they want to make available for loan. And then we'll get together as a group and then, okay, now we have to put a lot of hard work into this now as which is the right pathway. Where do we want them going to whom, what style of football and, and all those sort of things. So, What's Stuart like to work with? Because obviously he's another one with a brilliant media persona. Yeah. He, he, he's a guy who says what he thinks and he's a guy who's got a clear vision. What's that like to work for? I, I, I think, he, you know, not, again, I'm not just saying, I think he's brilliant. I think he's been fantastic for the football club since he came through the door. He, um, you know, I didn't know him before that. But obviously, you know, of of him and what he's done and he's taken Huddersfield with the greatest respect into the Premier League. Uh, so you're thinking, well, this is going to be interesting. And he's obviously then gone and done it here as well. Um, but but a fantastic person, knows his job, works incredibly hard. You know, there's, it's almost like work. There's no there's no hours to your day, your daily work. No, you just work. Um, 
put so much trust and value and respect into his staff. You know, he trusts you. You want to work for him and is very clear on what he wants and very and um, does things, doesn't dither, doesn't, you know, gets things done. Uh, and to work for someone like that is, you know, it's, it's, it's a privilege, you know, and I get on really well with Stuart. We work, we speak every day, you know, we'll go and watch games together. We, we have meetings on numerous things aside from loans. Uh, and I just think he's, he's been fantastic with this football club. You know, he's bought in Daniel who has gone on and, and by some, some of the supporters I've spoken to, particularly during lockdown when we were phoning a lot of supporters, they're, they're saying to me, you know, they've been watching the club for 50, 60 years and the football that we played in the championship promotion winning season was as good as they'd ever seen. I can believe it. You yeah. know, so you, you know, that's full credit to Daniel on the pitch. You know, Stuart Webber has been a part of bringing him in. Um, of course, everyone's going to get criticised. We know that. We've talked about that. But you think since he's come through the door, I think, I think he's, been, he's been excellent. And since Stuart and Daniel have, have been here, we hear a lot about the philosophy at the club. That word comes up a lot. What, what do you think the philosophy here is? It's quite, it's quite clear for me. You've got a philosophy on the pitch and a philosophy off the pitch. I've just spoken a bit about the off the pitch. But what, we, what Stuart wanted and Daniel wanted and, and will do and hopefully will carry on and on is we have to have an identity on the pitch. People have to know how Norwich, what Norwich City are. What's the, people talk about DNA and all that. I don't go into all that sort of thing. I talk about how you play. And you should be able to speak to the supporters, the press, you know, the opposition, anybody. You talk about Norwich, ah, oh, they'll go, oh, this, that, and that. You, you have that identity in creating that philosophy. And I think anyone would know, well, ask anybody how Norwich play. They will be able to tell you how, how we play, what the profiles of each player it needs to be. And that's that's... That takes time, and, and Stuart and Daniel have got that now. So the reason for that being, if we lose our right-back, Max Ahrens, he goes off to, I don't know, Barcelona. He was right. linked with them, <laughs> exactly. wasn't he? <laughs> then it shouldn't be, crikey, what we're going to do now? Who do we get in? Do we get in a six-foot-eight, you know, tall guy? Do we get in a small guy who's rapid? Do we get in a tough tack? No, that, that should already have been done with, with your philosophy. Okay, one's gone, one comes in. You know, one player, one member of staff goes out. Well, one comes in. It shouldn't have to be a massive upheaval and churn like we spoke about in the mid-90s where one guy comes in, new manager comes in, completely changes everything. Well, we've just worked three, four years on that or whatever and you've got to go his way. Then he leaves and, you know, another guy comes in who likes long ball football. Oh, we've got to change it all again. You can't throw, like I say, or invest, say throw, invest as much money in the club as we have done and then completely change it because you get in someone else who doesn't believe any any of that and wants to change it all his way. So creating that philosophy, that identity, takes a lot of time, a lot of work. Um, and hopefully now, I'm pretty, pretty sure, it will never, you'll never lose that now. Yeah, and it's all about that self-sustainability, a bit of a mouthful to say, yeah. but, but we hear about that as well because I guess with the likes of, say, a player like James Madison or, or Ben Godfrey, it must be really rewarding to see the time that's gone into, I say, nurturing them really and then for them to go on and have big money moves that's only going to be a good thing for, for Norwich here and they can reinvest, etc. And we were, you know, in a sticky situation only a few yeah. years back. That must be very rewarding to see kind of that come full circle. Ab absolutely. I mean, that's the the, the example of, of two great loans you've mentioned there, Ben going from, you know, Ben was playing right back in our 23s team and getting a little bit frustrated and he wanted to play in midfield and obviously did really well in midfield. Daniel with a stroke of genius, dropped him back 15 yards as a centre-back and you've, you've got a £25 million pound player all of a sudden. But his loans worked at Shrews. We've exposed him to, you know, League One football. He's done fantastically well. And you, you say finances then, you know, Ben's been sold for 20 £25 million, whatever it is. Hopefully we'll get to a point where we're back in the Premier League and then we don't have to do that. But self-sustaining self club, you know, self-finance club, unfortunately... Things like that have to happen if you're not competing in the top flight, if you've not got that finance behind you. Um, but the club is, it's its on a fantastic path for me at the minute. The structure, the philosophy, the strategies that are in place are there to support the club. And obviously it depends what happens on the pitch that underpins everything. But pleasingly this season, again, it looks like we've got a chance. We've got half a chance of being up there and involved and 
the dream. The dream ticket is obviously to get back into the Premier League and then establish ourselves there. You know, we don't want to be flitting up and down. Can we get into the Premier League? Can we sustain it? And then, you know, be buying players in for 25 million quid rather than having to sell them. I absolutely, you talked about it there. I love that about our club at the moment. The self-funding model, for me, I mean, I'll get labelled a happy clapper by, by some <laughs> supporters. But for me, I want a football club that behaves responsibly, yep. sends 11 of our best out there who want to wear that yellow and green every Saturday. If they give it their all, I'm a happy supporter. I, I know not all supporters feel like that. No. And, and, you know, I work out the football club, so of course I'm going to say that. But that's generally how I feel. And I think we're in a great position at the moment. Right? Model to be envied, isn't it, really, when you think about it? I, th I, th I don't think it's really a, a tough decision to make, to be honest with you, because the alterna alternative to what you've just alluded to there is you go out and gamble the club's mm. future. You go out and maybe spend 30, 40 million quid and doesn't work. You get relegated and... You call in the admin people, the, you know, the administrators, and all that. It, it, it can't happen, you know. Well, Stuart said it when we went into when COVID nineteen came along. Yeah. He said we shouldn't be in a position where, you know, clubs down the chain are, are, are threatening going out of business because they've missed two games because yeah. we can't yeah. have fans. Yeah. In. Like, it, 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 it is. I mean, it's a gamble, and people. You, you talk about supporters. Everyone has a right. Some people would have said no. We would have wanted them to do that. Go and spend forty million. We might have stayed in the Premier League. Who knows? You never know. But the alternative to that is gambling that and it going wrong and then the club has to go into admin or, God think, you, you know, go to the wall. In a healthy position, definitely. And, and as for ones to watch, because I'm sure, I mean, I for one, and I'm sure a lot of Norwich fans would want to know, like, I think you've got about 20 players out on loan. 21. Right? 21. 21 at the minute. Who, who would you say uh, any to really be looking at and, and keeping an eye on at the minute? bit reluctant to name the names I said, I don't, I don't, I'll, I'll pick out one at the moment who's doing particularly well Akin Fanwo who's yes. at Charlton yeah who was unfortunately injured at the minute but he has he's played seven games for them and he's had six clean sheets on a in the on a row in the row which is pretty much unheard of at any level of football you know let alone league one you know he went there played the first game the they lost two nil and he was only on the pitch for one one of the goals and then he started the next six games and they didn't concede a goal. And Akin had a, a really successful loan at St Mirren last season in the Scottish Premier League. You know, he played against Celtic Rangers and good sides as well as some not so good sides up there. Uh, and he came back and he was close to being in our first team. And it was another one of those, similar to Ben Godfrey, where I give a lot of credit to, to Daniel with... Um, like with Ben Godfrey, when Ben went to Shrewsbury on loan, the easiest thing for Daniel, the safest thing would have been to kept him here and had him on his bench in case a centre-back got injured or a centre midfielder got injured. And if that would have been the case, Ben would have probably played six, seven games for us, maybe a few subs. And Daniel and we decided and with Stuart that, yeah, we might risk not having him here if we get a few injuries, we might be but that's actually better for him to go there and play 50 games, I think he played, so that then he has a better chance of coming back and being a regular for us rather than just someone who's he's a good sub, but he's never going to get in the first team unless he gets games. I remember Stuart saying about Ben Godfrey, he said, Ben Godfrey is not going to be another player that we bring in, loan out and never see again. Yeah. If he doesn't become an established first team player, we have failed in our yeah. job. Uh, and, and there you go. And so by keeping him here, you, you, never, you never know, do you? You never know. He goes on, he's a bit part player. So we, we sent him to Shrewsbury, obviously, because I, I know Paul Hurst well. And I've seen their training ground. I know how their club works really closely. And we knew that would be the right move for him. A lot of people were like, why are you sending one of our to Shrewsbury? And I'm not being disrespectful to Shrewsbury because we've had Louis Thompson there, Carl Morris there. We've sent a few there. They, they've, they've got it right like we've got it right. They play the right type of football that we play. And Ben went there as a holding midfield player, did exceptionally well. Um, did really well against West Ham in the FA Cup. You know, we were Premier League and, you know, sort of raised everybody's eyebrows at yeah, Shrewsbury. Like pretty much some are raising their eyebrows now. Why Telstar in the Dutch second division? I was going to ask. There's a, <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of work gone <laughs> yeah. into it that, you know, we, we feel that's the right way. Um, when, it, when it happens like that, improves them, them fantastic. So a lot to be very positive about yeah. as an Norwich fan. Yeah, like I say, there's you know we've got a lot of young players, and there may be some of the younger players who are doing well now in the under 23s who are playing, particularly well in the EFL Trophy games. They might go on loan in January if they're ready. 
and and this is a, an, another discussion we'll have. You know, you don't just throw players out on loan if they've done well. You've got to make sure it's right for them because that could break them. It's been fascinating to, to get your insight on all of that. So much to, to talk about there. Just finally, um, what does Norwich City mean to you, if you can sum that up? I think it's pretty much my life, Alice. Um, you know, it's, I, I, re I refer to it as my club. You know, you, I've had played for Stoke, Everton, Oldham. They're all my clubs, if you like. But this is this is home. This is you know where we are. This is you know I've I've been part of this club. I've been I've given everything for this club, and equally they've given me the opportunity to work here in various roles and capacities over the last 26 years. Um, I thoroughly love it. I enjoy it here. Um, it's a fantastic place to be, but it's even better when you've got the people that are in place now, for the want of a better word, that are, they know what they're doing. They're, they're fantastic at the jobs and it's, it's a pleasure to get up and go to work every morning. Oh, it is a pleasure to have you here doing doing what you're doing and, and thank you so much for joining us on the podcast It's been terrific, today. Neil. It thank has. you so much. Thank you for your insight. My pleasure, thank you. Being so open, thank so, you. Thanks very much.